Hi, everybody. My name is Jared McCormick. I'm the acting director and the director of uh, graduate studies here at NYU in the Kevorkian Center. Um, again, so nice to see so many familiar names and faces. Um, I want to welcome you to the second part of the sister event from a couple weeks ago, Digital, Digital Data Gathering, Changing Ways of Knowing Number Two. This is the Social Media Afterlives. Um, I just have a couple quick remarks and then we're going to uh, get started. Um, we're gonna be sending a bunch of stuff in the chat. Um, this is the Digital Forays uh, series of events, which is happening uh, in the fall last semester uh, through the end of this year. There's also at the Kevorkian Center Global Uprisings, which is kind of the other um, companion series running throughout the whole year. Um, so check the chat for upcoming events. Um, I do want to let everybody know that this is being recorded and it will be on YouTube, um, as are all of the other uh, prior events. Um, so I want to start first by thanking the um, here at NYU, the Global Journalism. They are our co-sponsor for this event. Um, and just to give a little bit of, of framing for this, I was writing the description for this panel back um, right after the Capitol was stormed and we were in that big um, mess of uh, kind of sorting out exactly what had happened. And, um, you know, the event was planned, but in part of the framing, it was what happens after you hit post or send. Um, and so much of that conversation, at least in, in, in those ensuing weeks were, um, you know, the, the metadata of people's cell phones, the videos that people maybe took for the purpose of excitement, but then is used to incriminate them. Um, and so there's many instances uh, across the region of changing social media usage. And so this panel was really put together to try to think about, um, yes, this 10 year anniversary of, of the uh, Arab Springs, but also as uh, the description says, a panel about longevity, ephemerality, and the digital afterlives of moments, photos, and phrases which prove, show, or create realities. So um, we are going to hear from, we have three panelists and a discussant. Uh, the three panelists each get 10 minutes to kind of put an entry point, a provocation onto the table. We will pivot through each of them, which will take half an hour. And um, then we'll hear from the discussant. They'll all engage and then uh, we'll open it up for q and I just wanna encourage everyone, um, you feel free in the chat to uh, post comments, questions um, at any point. And when we do get to the Q&A, you can also raise your hand um, or signal that to us and we can um, unmute you. So without um, fully introducing everyone, we're gonna be sending their bios in the chat. Um, we have Yakin abdel uh, who is calling in. Yakin, I, I, don't, I, you, I didn't write it down, but are you in North Carolina? I'm in Philadelphia, the great Philadelphia. Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, Philadelphia, we have Mark Owen Jones, who is joining us from Doha, um, Marlene Schaefers, who is in Brussels, and Adel Iskandar, who is out in the Vancouver area, I believe. So we are spanning the globe here. Um, I will stop there and hand it over to Yakin, um, and very much looking forward. Thank you so much for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I will dive uh, uh, directly into uh, what I'm trying to bring to the table here. And basically, uh, I have two vignettes uh, that I want to suggest reading with you. And then I will quickly say uh, my point uh, and maybe end with some thesis if we have time. So the first vignette is from a YouTube video that actually I ran into randomly through a serendipity. Uh, from a series that is called Final Revisions. Uh, the, uh, the creator is called like Muragan He or Final Revisions. And it's an, ana an analysis of five minutes, uh, as, uh, a segment, five minutes segment from a play called Alabanda that started running in Egypt in uh, 1998. So notice that this, this segment is, is, uh, is also a recording of a live play, right? So it's a, it's a live performance 
but this this is like the segment that they are that uh, final revisions guy is analyzing is the segment that was recorded for media distribution and in recording for media distribution actors have to kind of mind their positions on the stage where they are standing where they are looking uh, how they move in the stage and so on so there's a particular setting that is different from just performing life okay so when you watch this five segments without the analysis, or well, what you're seeing is the funny segments with like lots of jest and jeer. But what's happening, what, what the final revisions guy is showing us is that actually this segment is a dialogue uh, between the actors, between the actors and the crew, between the actors and the director and so on. Let me, let me explain because I think it's kind of messy and I wanted to, um, show it but my internet is bad so i would just show maybe a still screen so there are three layers of creativity here one layer is just actors uh, on the stage uh, making the audience laugh so we get that there's another layer which is that act like no, it's so messy uh, there's confusion on the stage the actors don't know where to go, where to stand, where to move, where to look. So what they are doing is that they are talking to each other while in character to negotiate what to do. This is fascinating. What's happening is that every word they are saying is something that is said by the character to make the audience laugh. But at the same time, it's something said to the crew to mean something. When they express frustration, they're expressing frustration to the crew, but they are also expressing it in character. It's fascinating because there's like two different layers of meaning here. And there's a third layer of meaning, a third layer of creativity, which is the deciphering, the excavating of those layers by uh, the final revisions guy. So we don't know that there is this messiness, this kind of like uh, uh, dialogue, implicit dialogue between the actors because of a media gossip or something, but rather because this, like, this uh, creator is moving, uh, forwarding, rewinding, slowing down, trying to find patterns and so on. It's so convincing in such a fascinating way. Okay, so one thing that this makes me think of is how we are here in a different realm than the hermeneutical or the semiotical, like in order or like in the realm of the semiotic analysis. We we're not talking here about just multiple meanings, but rather we're talking about layers of meaning on the top of each other. It's as if the media object is sedimenting layers of meaning, one on the top of the other. I want to think of that as a play of repetition and difference. I mean, to, to kind of like also work with Deleuze a little bit, but in like play of repetition and difference in the sense that every layer is repeating something in the background, but also adding a shade of difference. And if every layer is different, but it's getting that difference by repeating something in the background. Okay. This also make me think of what is the aspect that is related to the digital here? In other words, you can do the same thing with the VHS, right? You can uh, get a VHS tape, analyze it, see what's happening and so on. But here, there's something something different. It's, it's not just that the final revisions guy, the creative is like analyzing the meaning and like reading through it and kind of like telling us what is happening. He's also producing content. He's also editing this media to create a specific and new layer of creativity. This is, I think, very crucial. Okay. So let me close this because the internet is so slow, I think. Let me go to the second vignette. Speaking of the digital, uh, it is from uh, a research paper uh, uh, that is done in collaboration between uh, uh, Cornell Tech and Technicon. And it's an analysis of 8 million tweets, uh, uh, the tweets of like a voter fraud claim in the US in uh, December to November to December 2020. Uh, and it's analysis of 8 million tweets, 26 million retweets, uh, roughly, and uh, retweets by 3 million users. Okay. So what's interesting for me here is this graph analysis. So what's happening here? Basically, we're looking at what they did is that they used 
uh, what is called clustering modules. Basically, there are machine learning modules, machine learning libraries that learn how to kind of like take all this data and cluster it into different groups without necessarily know what the, what those clusters would mean. So, for example, you have Shakespeare and Dickens and you give, give like this library is like Shakespeare and Dickens and it can differentiate between them. It says like this, this group is one, one group, this is another group. Okay. Let's look closely at, can you see this? Yeah. Is thing? Perfect. So let's, let's look at the phrase, like this kind of like graph analysis quickly. Every node here is a user and the, the edges are kind of uh, uh, the retweets. Okay. And the analysis is showing us five clusters. What does that mean? That means that the machine learning modules is saying that there are like about five different topics, five different groups of retweets happening here. There's the blue, there's the red, there's the yellow, there's the purple, and there's the green. Okay, so this is like one layer, right? It's done by machine learning modules. The second layer is that if we looked closely at these retweets, we would find that the red ones are the promoters of the voter uh, fraud claim, and the blue ones are the detractors of the voter uh, uh, fraud claims. This is a new layer of meaning, right? So by looking more, we get a new layer of meaning. Okay. But then you can also talk about a third layer of meaning. Remember, we don't, there's like layers we don't know about yet. What is that yellow? What is that purple? What's that green? When you add a new level of metadata by that, when you start to account for the users who have been suspended by uh, Twitter, you discover that they are clustered here. So basically, this is a graph of the users in this graph who have been suspended by Twitter. And you discover that the orange here is those who were suspended, which are, is the same as the yellow. And those who were suspended were the QAnon kind of users. So this means that this yellow group is actually the QAnon promoters, the promoters of the voter fraud uh, claims. This is a new layer of meaning. Notice that there is another layer that we don't know yet about, like the purple one, who are those people? Like the green one, who are those users? Okay. So quickly to reflect on this uh, uh, graph, notice that machine learning models also work through structures of repetition and difference. That's how the machine learns. It keeps repeating what's happening, keep learning what's happening, and understand the difference between the features in, in, in the objects that it is consuming. That's one thing. Notice also that these layers playing on this theme of repetition and difference. Every, when you add a new layer, you see a new aspect of difference here. Okay. So let me go to my point. How much time do I have? You have like two and a half minutes. Perfect. So here is my uh, main point quickly. Uh, I want to talk about, think about the digital and afterlife and like social media afterlife as in terms of the new ways of scalability that they bring. Okay. What does that mean? I'm not interested in the digital here as like in the like kind of like, um, common debates between is it new, not new, is it like, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in, in those debates right now as much as I'm trying to capture a specific qualifier related to digital technology, particularly to the technology of sampling here. Okay, so, and I'm saying that there's a new ways of scalability happening here, okay. And by scalability, I don't mean that there's simply we're expanding the scale or that we are kind of like uh, accelerating time or annihilating space. No, I'm saying there's a new way of layering, new way of zooming in and out, new way, new way of relating the micro and the macro. Okay. New ways of thinking about the scale itself. So one can say that in the afterlife of digital media, one can layer things on each other where the difference between thick description and big data really collapses. So I'm suggesting, I wanna think with you about how can we think of digital afterlife in terms of thick data? That's one thing. And second, 
is how can we think of these layers of every use as a form of repetition that is adding difference and that these differences between different uses, between different messages are nothing but repetition of something that was happening at some point. So maybe I, one last thing I would say is that it's important here to remember something like what Walter Benjamin was saying in the uh, classic uh, art in the age of mechanical reproduction. He was talking about the aura and so on, that's very common. But there's obsession in this article. Uh, he is obsessed with the relationship between techni as like the creative use of technicalities of technology and perception. So he would talk about like, for example, how the camera, the lens is and I'm, when I use this quote here verbatim, is causing profound change of our a perception, end of quote. And he is saying a perception, not perception. It's not that we perceive things that we didn't perceive before. It is that it's a completely new way of thinking. The capacity of zooming in and zooming out is something so recent in the history of humankind. It's a, it's a new kind of sense, new kind of sensorium in a way. And I'm saying digital media is doing something like that. Uh, I had some questions related to like the relevance of Arab uprisings uh, in 2011 and all of that, but I think I will wait till we go to the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very interesting provocation. Um, a lot to think through there. We're gonna pivot to Mark, but um, I just wanted to, something I forgot to say in the beginning. Uh, the final event in the digital foray series this year um, is just an open call for junior scholars to present their um, ongoing work, work that they're trying to kind of use digital tools as a, a process, as a product. I'm just going to put the poster in the chat, um, just a reminder for those of you that don't know. Um, back to kind of continuing, Yakin, the question of scale, uh, Mark, passing it on to you. Uh, thank you. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, thanks, Yakin, too, for that very interesting conversation. Um, I'm I'm sort of reflecting um, on what it is I do, and I, I don't want to assume that everyone uh, in this room knows exactly what I do. So I want to give a bit of context um, on the kind of social media analysis that I've been involved in, and I want to discuss a bit about the kind of almost ethical reflections uh, and distinctions between public and private information that has that have sort of come to my mind during the course of my research. Um, firstly, I mean, I, I tend to focus on Twitter analysis. Uh, I download large amounts of Twitter data, mostly on uh, events or hashtags related to uh, what's going on in the Middle East, particularly those in Arabic. Uh, and I look at harassment campaigns against people and I look at disinformation campaigns. So a lot of the data I lose, uh, you look at thousands of accounts, thousands of tweets, a bit like in the diagram Yakin showed. And I look at that data and I maintain records and archives of that data on my, uh, on, the, on my cloud, my personal cloud. So what really I'm doing is extracting this data that was at some point, a moment in time, as it were, public. And then I, because I'm downloading that data, I'm then rendering that data part of my personal collection. Uh, and then I have at that moment, the power to make that data private depending on a decision I make. And obviously this poses all sorts of ethical questions because whoever has uploaded uh, this data has then had it harvested. And you know you can argue that that person knew that when they were uploading, it was gonna be public and then it could be susceptible to this kind of harvesting or mining of data. Uh, so the question I kind of wonder is when, at what point is it wrong or right or ethically questionable that, that you lose control or agency over the data that you've uploaded? And to give like an example, I mean, what's very common now and what we see is, is the kind of notion of keeping receipts, right? I mean, for most of you who use Twitter or social media of some description will probably be aware of certain uh, arguments that go on on Twitter or discussions between people. And, and oftentimes someone might screenshot a tweet and then say, yeah, but you said this a certain amount of years ago or months ago or weeks ago. Uh, and this is interesting, it might seem banal in some cases, but in many cases, for example, that particular thing that the person had said had been deleted by that person uh, for all intents and purposes, they regretted saying it or they, they disagreed with what they said, or they changed their mind, all these things. However, because that was screenshotted or archived, which you can do now on the web, that thing is never truly uh, private again. 
um, it no longer becomes their private property. And then someone has the ability to use that in a kind of weaponized way against that person. So for me, that's interesting because it, a lot of the research I do involves trying to expose, for want of a better word, expose what I see as um, ethically dubious state-led information operations, right? So in these cases, if we're dealing with accounts that are, uh, can be seen as state agitators or uh, belonging to uh, PR companies who are doing you know, mercenary work on behalf of questionable regimes, how, what ethical question should we ask about sort of exposing the links of these kind of accounts or these data publicly, right? So if you're documenting a campaign of a harassment against a journalist, you are then posting the data or images of those data or images of those accounts involved in that campaign uh, and their involvement in a certain uh, activity. Is it ethical to do so? And I particularly think this because so much of the, one of the tactics that you see in these in these cases is that uh, ephemerality is almost a tactic used by these accounts to avoid detection, right? So what I would do, if you, you might see a campaign targeting a specific journalist, right? Uh, accusing them in misogynistic language of, of, of false things. And they might be 20, 30,000 tweets all targeting this journalist, uh, which has happened. Um, and then I download those tweets and I examine them. And then the accounts that issue those tweets, then deliberately delete them in order to evade, for example, Twitter's ability to kind of algorithmically sift or, uh, you know, um, assess those accounts for automated behavior or coordinated behavior. However, they then delete those tweets, but and I still have them. So I still have a record of what they deleted, but on a large scale, sort of like 20,000. So I have, now I have the ability to make this information public that whoever initiated this campaign wanted to be private, right? And their desire to keep that private or their attempt to keep it private is very much part of the functionality of how they weaponize this platform. So for me, having access to that data is a form of uh, in power in a way. It's a form of me having the ability to be able to one, document that this event is happening and two, also highlighting that there is a coordinated effort uh, which is targeting these journalists. If I didn't have that data, there would be no uh, way to actually determine that there was this reality in which uh, thousands of accounts actually launched this attack on someone. I mean, there would be, I mean, uh, unless you, for example, sourced all this data from someone else who was doing this research or someone that happened to have the same data, or you could go to Twitter and then ask for that data, which as many of us researchers think area know is pretty much impossible to do, right? So there's this kind of strange dynamic here where you sort of think this F morality is being utilized in some cases as a weapon. And if it weren't for this documentation, that, that this kind of real-time documentation that involves taking this public data and making it private and keeping it and using it, then there would be almost a certain amount of gaslighting going on saying, ha, ah, we attacked this journalist, but there's no evidence that we did it. And this is becoming quite interesting because in a particular case that I'm talking about, which is the harassment of an Al Jazeera journalist, Surah Dorais, the need in, in this case, she has launched a, in, in sort of a slightly unprecedented case, a, a legal case against a group of people she claims took her private information from her phone, hacked it, published it online, and then created this the thousands of accounts attacked it. Uh, but if it weren't for the fact that there was evidence to suggest coordinated activity from these accounts, there would be very little basis for a legal case, right? And to try and get that information from Twitter again would be very difficult. So there's another question here of when we talk about this notion of private and public data and ephem ephemeral data, I hate that word, I can never say it, is you know, when is it useful to have this data and who should have that data and who should actually have the control over that data? Because at the moment in, in, in the context I see it in, in authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, a lot of times, you know, because social media platforms are being weaponized and instrumentalized as a tool of intimidation, disinformation, repression, then it's, it's difficult to sort of know uh, who and what should be done with that data and how best to process that data in a way that actually attempts to uh, resolve this issue of digital technology being appropriated by, appropriated by authoritarian regimes, because that's actually what's happening in many ways. 
the technology is being appropriated. So how do you wrestle back control in terms of documentation and monitoring without taking this data and trying to form a coherent analysis with it? And this is, this is one of the things that I wrestle with, this kind of public private distinction. On the one hand, you have this notion where you're taking and hoovering up data and in that data, you're sucking up people or sucking up information that that's, uh, you know, belongs to people who have probably nothing to do with this or, or anything ethically questionable, problematic. But at the same time, you also need this data to be able to document and make visible the scale of harassment and repression that's going on, right? And so this for me is just the kind of, the intervention I wanted to make is this issue of the ethics of data and who owns and, and has that data and whether it's right to keep that data and how we should use this data uh, in terms of trying to, you know, make visible the scale of a lot of the operations we see. And that's what I, I, an interesting aspect, just a kind of reflection on digital humanities is one of the aspects of, uh, of the digital is that we, we're now in a position to kind of, you know, um, uh, show knowledge in new ways or show things in new ways. And as, as you know, Yakin showed with that graph, you can see, you can now visualize the scale of these kind of intimidation and harassment operations. Uh, and you need data to do that. And in order to, to show those things has a different impact from then describing those things. And I, so I think there's an interesting element to how having that data and using that data to create new forms of, of images uh, is actually a very powerful thing. Uh, and a necessary thing. So repurposing data for, for other means, tr transmogrifying that data into different things is also super useful in the context of studying digital authoritarianism. And that's, I kind of want to end on just that kind of reflection and, and, uh, and, and conundrum, I suppose. Okay, great. Thank you so much. This is actually so interesting the way you, you both have very strong provocative questions that you're putting on, on the table. Um, we'll pass it to Marlene. Uh, yes, uh, so thanks a lot um, for, for the invitation uh, to, this, to this event today. Um, so uh, I will also dive sort of right in. And um, so I want to approach this question of social media afterlives a little bit differently. And um, rather than focusing on the afterlives of social media, um, what I'm doing um, a bit more is looking at afterlives in social media. So um, uh, when I say afterlife here, the afterlives that I'm really interested in are the afterlives um, of Kurdish fallen fighters who've lost their lives in the struggle for Kurdish autonomy. On the other hand, you have many Kurds who commemorate these fallen fighters as martyrs who've sacrificed their lives for the Kurdish cause. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the Turkish state that spends enormous amounts of resource and energy to prevent precisely such commemoration um, as, and prevent um, these fallen fighters from having these uh, afterlives as martyrs. And so, um, uh, and so it does so by you know, a whole range of different, um, uh, different sort of measures, including disappearing the bodies of, um, of fallen Kurdish militants, prohibiting funerals, destroying cemeteries and so on. And so in my ongoing research, I look at this contestation really as a point of departure for thinking through afterlives as a site where political power is both made and unmade. And so what I'm trying to do is to map the different forms of social labor that go into transforming um, Kurdish fallen militants into these politically potent martyr figures. And so one site where I seek to trace um, the making of these material afterlives is um, social media and, and the digital realm um, more broadly. And I should say that this is quite new terrain for me um, as I've been doing more sort of classical quote unquote ethnographic uh, field work in the past. And it's also really very much ongoing research. So um, I'll be probably, um, you know, raising more questions than providing answers, but, um, and it goes a little bit in a different direction than, um, you know, what we've talked about so far, but I still hope that, you know, these reflections, um, these first reflections coming out of this ongoing research will be useful um, for this conversation. So um, just to also give you um, a little bit of a, I will share my screen. Um, all right, here, hopefully you can see this now. Um, so what you can see here um, are correlations. So it's a, a similar type of graph as we've, we've seen here. And, and here, um, what we've done is we've um, uh, looked um, at tweets in Twitter. Um, this is a little bit over 7,000 tweets um, that all have the hashtag um, Shahid Namarin. 
And she, Namaran means uh, martyrs don't die or the martyrs are immortal in Kurdish. And so it's a really a key slogan in the commemoration of, um, of Kurdish martyrs is something that you hear at funerals, that you see at demonstrations, and then also you see um, on social media being used uh, to commemorate the martyrs. Um, and so it's by focusing on this hashtag and the way, you know, how it's used on Twitter, that I'm trying to get a sense of the texture um, of um, Kurdish digital afterlives and to explore what immortality um, might mean in the digital uh, realm. Um, and um, so one thing that's important to mention and that links very much with what Mark just said um, is that the immortality that a hashtag like uh, Shahid Namurin articulates is really, really volatile. So one major reason for this is that the Turkish government exerts considerable pressure on social media companies to delete content that they um, consider quote unquote terrorist propaganda, which means that pro-Kurdish content on social media plat platforms is routinely um, being deleted and removed. And so in the, the corpus of tweets that we're looking at with this hashtag, we see that um, this is an archive that's full of holes in a way. So there are countless tweets and Twitter accounts um, that have been suspended and the vast majority of sort of embedded links um, to sites like Facebook and, um, and YouTube um, uh, have also, the, the content has also been um, deleted. Um, but um, in addition to this politically sort of volatile and contested and ephemeral sense of immortality that's created here, um, the, 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 the afterlives that I see are also um, highly decentralized. And this is where I'm getting back to this graph where um, you can see um, Shahid Namarin is at the center. So that blob in the center is um, Shahid Namarin. And then you have these clusters around um, of different hashtags. And, you, and we were looking at um, how connected these hashtags are. And it turns out that actually all these pink ones um, <clears throat> are hashtags that have no relation except for uh, to Shahid Namarin. And then the green ones are a little bit more connected uh, amongst each other. But overall, we get the sense that um, that what's happening here is that we have um, really sort of very modular one-off interventions um, that don't really connect, that are not very much interconnected. Um, and um, we also, um, when we look at the way in which users interact with these tweets, um, we, we sort of get a similar sense of very modular and decentralized texture of digital immortality. So um, just to give you some examples, nearly half of the tweets with Shahid Namran have no likes at all, over half have no retweets, over 80% have no replies. Um, so, you know, none of this context, uh, content is in any way viral. Um, so we're not looking at this kind of thing that sort of attracts millions or thousands of clicks and likes. Um, and so um, these commemorative efforts are really very isolated. Um, and I think um, that, you know, in a lot of social media analysis, it seems that we really very much focus on you know, the stuff that goes viral. But I think actually these kind of one of interventions, the one tweet that kind of, you know, gets just one like is actually quite crucial because it very much shapes the effective texture of the afterlives that are produced in this digital space. So these tweets sort of quietly insert the memory of a martyr into their cyber every day. Um, they create a sort of constant flow of tweets in which followers of the movement continuously remind each other of the need to remember and honor the sacrifice of the martyrs. Um, and while there's a good amount of sort of ideological and quite nationalist slogans um, that are being shared about, you know, sort of, you know, the, the respect that ought to be paid to the martyrs and their sacrifice and so on. Overall, the texture of these um, online afterlives is very much shaped by quite intimate and personal forms of commemoration. Um, so um, these would be tweets um, that, you know, for example, people tweeting, um, you know, oh, my, my brother has fallen martyr as well today or um, tweets like, um, you know, may you rest in paradise, my cousin, um, or my heart is shattered. So quite sort of personal and um, intimate um, expressions of grief, sadness, often related to, um, with kinship um, terms. So my cousin, my brother, this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, it's also reflected, there are a number of other sort of things that we see um, that, um, you know, in, in, in this sample of tweets that we're looking at, um, the majority comes from private accounts. Um, so it's it's not very much driven by what I first expected to see that it, this kind of thing would be driven, these afterlives would be driven by political actors, political parties. And um, what we see is very much sort of a private and intimate kind of conversation. Um, and um, many of these intimate or personal um, tweets 
are aimed at commemorating um, specific individuals. So much of the digital labor that goes into commemorating um, the fallen has a very strong emphasis on individual names. Um, it's really like an insistence on um, inserting these names over and over again into online conversations. And, um, you know, uh, these would be things like you, you often have, for instance, just um, lists of names um, and then, you know, with a hashtag, Shaheed Namaran, um, the martyrs are immortal. And so people keep sort of, you know, if something is retreated, it's often just lists of names or people, you know, make quite an effort um, to mention names. Um, so um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I guess. Um, You've got like three minutes. Okay, very good. So, um, yeah, so what I see in, in tweets um, like this, these kind of tweets that, you know, have lists of names of specific individual names, um, or often names are also turned into hashtags. Um, and even though they don't go viral, um, what I really um, think is happening here is that there's a deliberate effort to recuperate individuals from what can easily appear like sort of an indistinguishable mass of martyrs. And remember that in Northern Syria alone, and I'm not even talking about Turkey here, um, over 10,000 fighters have been killed in the struggle for Kurdish autonomy um, just in the last um, 10 years. So this emphasis on the individual, um, I think is driven by sort of an anxiety about the way in which individual martyrs, individual afterlives uh, risk getting lost within the mass of the fallen, um, a mass that materializes on social media as you know, people's Twitter timelines and Facebook news feeds fill up with a continuous stream of names and images of newly fallen martyrs. And in the face of this stream, an enormous amount of digital, um, political, effective labor goes into bestowing sort of a lasting afterlife onto every single martyr. And at the same time, so there's a little bit of an os interesting oscillation here between this emphasis on the individual afterlife and then how that sort of aggregates into a larger um, collective sacrifice and collective afterlife. And to give you a short impression of how that visually looks like, um, I wanted to show you just a brief clip of um, a, a video on YouTube that's, um, uh, that's uh, you know, has been sort of edited and um, has been circulated, circulating a lot on Facebook, a little bit also on Twitter. Um, and I'm just going to show you um, a, a minute or so to give you sort of a sense of how um, there's this sort of a politics of individuation and aggregation that happens at the same time. So these individual afterlives intersecting with a more sort of collective afterlife. Um, Um, so yeah, I guess you you sort of get the point of this sort of intersection of you know sort of a focus on the individual and then how that individual aggregates into a larger whole, um, and so. I think, um, I mean, we can talk again, sort of pick this up perhaps in the discussion, but I think there's something to be said here about how the digital allows for this kind of oscillation to happen and how this creates a specific kind of afterlife um, where sort of we have this oscillation between a collective and an individual um, that I think is quite fascinating um, and how it plays out in aesthetic terms and visual terms like this. Um, and I think I'll just leave it here and then we can um, elaborate in the discussion. 
Great, thank you so much, Marlene. I will pass it to Adler for his remarks. Thank you. So, can you, everybody hear me? Hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Jared. Uh, thank you, James. Thanks to everybody at Kivo for making this possible. It's a pleasure to be there. Um, I have to say, I'm I'm really uh, I'm still sort of recovering from the images. It's a very jarring uh, image to see so many um, young people lost uh, to conflict, and I suspect that is part of how afterlives work in the digital world is is the attempt to. Uh, to reinstate uh, the relationship between the corporeal and the memorialized. Um, and so I think that is a stream that runs throughout uh, the presentations. I, I was, I mean, I have to say I'm three hours behind uh, the, behind Eastern time. Um, so today's uh, presentations by Yakin and, and Mark and, and Marlene really gave me an adrenaline rush. Uh, it, was, it was very, very exciting and very provocative on so many levels. Um, I, I can't help but, but stick to my sort of uh, academic inclinations, which is to say that um, I'm going to offer some reflections or some thoughts and contemplations and musings about each of the presentations and hopefully sort of weave them uh, into some meaningful um, uh, narrative. But I have to say this, this was a really remarkable panel. Um, so my salutations for, uh, for, for everyone involved. Uh, Yaqeen, I was very much... Um, uh, you know, moved by uh, the manner in which you were able to uh, bring forth both your fascination and and um, and intrigue uh, in digital afterlives with uh, with the sort of um, anthropological kind of dimension of things. The experiential uh, was very self evident, or sort of your appeal to call upon. Uh, the need to recognize the experiential uh, in the digital was was really important. You started with Alabanda and that that sort of infamous scene that you're describing, uh, the role of enactment and performance, uh, and sort of I remember from that particular performance as well. There's a scene where the like the where Hinedi kind of loses his script, but at the same time is able. To, I don't know if this is exactly the scene, but uh, but the, there is that kind of dynamic happening between crew and performers. Um, and so I am very much, sent, you know, sentimentally responsive uh, to your idea of the importance of recognizing layers of meaning uh, and sedimentation in that regard. Um, and then you sort of move us laterally to recognize how that looks uh, when we talk about the visualization of data. So visualization becomes a form, some, some uh, sort of performative space as well. I'm thinking of all of a sudden I started thinking of visualizations as performance and what it means to kind of engineer that. So the moment that you take apart this visualization, you begin to see new, uh, new layers of meaning. Um, you, um, your discussion around scalability, again, this is, you know, this is, I'm, I'm seeing both uh, Gertz and I'm seeing, uh, you know, Jody Dean kind of having, duking it out with each other. Uh, but I'm, I'm really sort of um, intrigued by the way you, you discussed uh, thick description and how that translates into data. Um, my, you know, my personal sort of inclinations are ones of, uh, of sort of hesitation and perhaps not, not in disagreement, but rather um, a, a sort of thinking about what it means for abridgment and obfuscation and violence to, uh, to separate uh, the sort of individual from the collective and what, and what that means. And we see that later on in, in Marlene's work. Uh, but I was very much in, um, interested in um, the role that gathering, changing, and knowing, which are sort of thematics of, of this particular panel, uh, permeate every aspect of, of, your, um, of the questions that you raised. Um, and then in, in Mark's presentation, um, you know, I, I think this is a cross-cutting observation, but I would say that the political appear to be front and center, uh, and the role that pl power plays in um, arbitrating, if you will, uh, what is considered uh, acceptable or not acceptable, what survives in the afterlife, or what ends up having a, um, 
sort of a lease on life, if you will, in those in those spaces. Uh, I couldn't help but think about that in in light of the questions that you raised about um, who gets to who owns the data, uh, who's allowed to mine it, um, and and the ethical questions you raise. I have to say that it it must take a tremendous amount. I mean, I've obviously I'm familiar with your work and I've followed. Uh, what you've done for some time, but I think it takes a, fir- a, f- a, su- a substantial amount of courage to uh, to posit these ethical questions because embedded within them is a fair amount of self scrutiny. Uh, what does it mean for me to being doing this work? And and so I'm thinking of you, uh, kind of negotiating this discussion about what does it mean for me to have this data and what can I best do with it and how will this be remembered? Uh, you use terms like you know harvesting and mining and all of which are kind of um, um, it speaks to the um, the way in which we kind of engineer and work with data uh, and c- sort of contort them. Uh, and, you know, the empirical scientist might say, well, you know, it's perfectly reasonable, you know, where it's a negotiation between variables. But, uh, but you're asking a question that's much grander and much more uh, sort of connected to the social justice uh, queries of our of our time. Uh, what it means for something to be public um, and and how to kind of retract publicness and render something private. Or if something is private, how do we publicize it if there's a quote unquote greater good? So those questions are are truly vexing, uh, to be frank. Uh, and and the and what you're raising about ethics and responsibility and weaponization. Um, it it immediately drew my attention to um, whether or not, um, weaponization becomes the the sort of the modus operandi of of afterlives at the end of the day. Like who, what we choose to um, sort of consolidate uh, and work with and curate in such a manner, so as to deploy with with purposeful, um, um, substan- substantiated, purposeful, um, outcome driven uh, pragmatism is precisely what gives something an afterlife. And that I think also manifests both in, in what Yakin's describing in his work and also Marlene with, uh, with Kurdish, uh, the lost Kurdish fighters. Um, the, the, que- the, the question around ephemerality, while it I think subsumes most of the discussion, um, I was left thinking, is anything truly ephemeral? You know, is, does everything have, a, you know, the possibility of being, uh, not to use sort of theological kind of terminology to describe this, but every time I think about afterlives, I think about how um, we, um, how we sort of, you know, contemplate, at least from a socio- sociocultural standpoint, the idea of kind of resurrection, rejuvenation, um, what, you know, what lives on uh, is, is, does everything have the potential to live on so long as it's been documented or archived or exists in some digital form? Uh, the, the uh, you know, the analog no longer sort of matters, if you will, or the corporeal no longer matters. So the social media uh, presence or those kind of footprints, those digital footprints uh, can continue to exist so long as they're being proliferated and aggregated and supported in some ways. But we, but where power lies is in the decision to uh, to take hold of those uh, of those particular kind of expressions or footprints and render them into something more worthwhile or more compelling or more potentially um, or give them sort of a, again a, this idea of a lease on life or a sort of breathing life into uh, what has otherwise um, uh, passed. Um, so I kept thinking across the board on this issue of uh, engineering consent and behavior, um, not to, you know, I'm obviously channeling uh, uh, Herman and Chomsky on, on this, but, but the idea that we are actively looking at the topography uh, of consent making in these social media uh, afterlives uh, and who gets to do that, you know, so for instance, when Trump is where in Twitter pulls the plug on Trump, then he no longer has the ability to produce knowledge content in these spaces. So therefore his footprint comes to an abrupt end or the suspended, um, uh, uh, the voter fraud claiming uh, account users that, uh, that Yachin described, what happens when that is discontinued? Uh, does, is that the end of afterlife or is there a life elsewhere? You know, so it raises the question of what are, if it's not these spaces, where are those other spaces and do they exist? 
Um, Marlene's presentation, honestly, this was really um, also extremely uh, interesting and very important. I've been following a lot of uh, similar research on the issue uh, on how communities commemorate uh, and consecrate their own um, fallen uh, and what they would describe as their own martyrs. There's a long history of that um, on uh, pal you know Palestinian afterlives uh, and also increasingly so in the digital media. So I see a lot of parallels there. Uh, the the literal focus on afterlife, I think, uh, brings all of this to fruition in a in a real sort of tangible way. Uh, so. Um, I kept thinking about, um, you know, the virtual temporality and spatiality, um, how, you know, whether humans actually do die at the end of the day with social media. Um, I've lost several family, I mean, this is not a moment to kind of disclose, but I've lost a lot of uh, close uh, family members. And I have to say, even though I have no contact with them, but I continue to kind of produce and reproduce them in the social media spaces. And they are even in their absence, are kind of arbitrating what it is that I share because I'm cognizant of their present absence, if that means anything, and, and the constant need to memorialize. Um, I've been interested in this and what you're describing specifically. I mean, my, you know, my direction is, is, is or, or my case study, if you will, is, is on Egypt, but what I've been using to describe this is the idea of the effigy um, and how effigies are used. We often think of effigies as um, sort of um, reconstituted, uh, um, you know, almost like a, in a Baudrillardian sense, like a, a simulacra of something that may have existed in the past. Uh, but we think of effigies as something that we typically try to destroy as an act of defamation or desecration of, of something that we hate. So like an effigy of a tyrant or, you know, somewhat, something of the sort, or a despot. Uh, but there are also effigies that we build and create to memorialize the things that we lose, that we love or care about and want to prolong uh, our contact with. And so I've been thinking about uh, in light of the uprisings in the Middle East and the Arab world and, and elsewhere, but also in other political manifestations, how effigies are part of the way we memorialize and how that translates into uh, the digital spaces. Um, I am, you know, I was, I was, I have to say, I was really quite fascinated by um, the uh, the way in which the data that you presented is so sort of the, the, the lack of clustering or the sort of disaggregation and the individuation of all these accounts and, 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 uh, and, um, and posts is an indication, as you said, I mean, of course it is individuated, but also collective in, in the consolidation of those, uh, of those messages. But it really drew my attention to the role, again, that power plays in, in either elevating or accentuating uh, some messages or some uh, afterlives at the expense of others. Um, we are, of course, at a time where um, there's a there's an open and, and lively discussion around uh, the late Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who all of us know, uh, and uh, and was brutally murdered in a Saudi consulate in in Turkey, um, and how his afterlife has taken on um, has far more gravitas. Uh, it is, of course, uh, supported in no small measure by so many different. Um, groups that are kind of lobbying for political purposes and functionality, but his adversaries are also doing the same thing. So uh, the it's almost like the the struggle over who gets to be remembered is is what this is all about, and a lot of it is fundamentally, as you said, uh, semiotic. Um, so there's an arbitration of language. You know, are are the fallen Kurdish soldiers martyrs? or are they terrorists? And the Turkish government is actively trying to push one thing at the expense uh, of another. Um, but it, uh, it is also an indication of how remembered some you know, afterlives are in some circles and where, whereby in other circles, they are actively forgotten. So we begin to see these incredible echo chambers uh, that we keep talking about in the hypothetical sense where self-selecting, we, we self-select the afterlives that we want to engage with and want and want to be surrounded by. Uh, so the real question is like, are, are these afterlives transferable? I mean, I can tell that I'm alive because I can, con I can be connected to those who, uh, who believe that I am alive and those who don't. But what happens if some people believe that I'm not alive, but 
I can no longer be sort of uh, corporeally connected to them. So I think this, I think the, the, the problem with afterlives now is effectively the disaggregation, uh, the division, the, di the, di the, um, uh, the, the opposite of, you know, it's proliferating. These are proliferating communities, but they are becoming so clustered and so isolated from one another that there isn't a mutual recognition, neither of the principles that dictate what should and should not have an afterlife or whether or not those lives either exist or should exist in the first place. Uh, where, um, you know, the, not only are the afterlives being desecrated, but that they are set, their afterlife, the, the absence of their corporeal life is celebrated, you know, and we see that whether we're talking about Bahrain, you know, Mark, all the work that Mark has been doing on Bahrain, or in, in Kurdish communities, and, and also in Egypt, there's, there's so many different contexts to all of this. So all this to say that, um, I'm, I'm reminded by the work of Bakhtin, of Baudrillard, Bakhtin on the Carnivalesque, because a lot of this is really noisy, and I, and I appreciate, uh, every, you know, um, Yaqeen, Mark, and, and, and Marlene's ability to help, help us sort of parse through all of this with really meaningful, tangible uh, examples and circumstances that we can, uh, that we can uh, chew on. I'm also drawn to Baudrillard, uh, and, but also Edward Said on the issue uh, when he talks about how the mere act of representation is a violent act. So when we try to represent, we are naturally obfuscating. We are naturally excising the two-dimensional photo. Like, and so we don't typically think about that in regards to data because we are always compelled to consider uh, volume over nuance. And, and so the more information we have, the, the closer we believe we're getting to uh, all that is knowable. And, and I think that, uh, that complication is precisely what all three presenters gave us, you know, almost like a, wait a minute, let's really think about what this idea of, of volume and, and as Yakin said, like scalability, like what does scalability look like? What are we losing with scalability? But at the same time, recognizing that scalability allows us to see so many different layers of, of, uh, of, of volume, of impact, of meaning, creation, and of memorialization in the case of afterlives. So I'll, I'll end with, with that, but, but I just have to say I, my incredible gratitude to all three presenters and everybody who organized this. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I look forward to our discussion. And maybe I should put a question, or, or <laughs> is that enough to like trigger some thoughts? In yeah, no, I I think that that's uh, that's wonderful. I'm just gonna add in everybody here on the spotlight, um, and um, Adil, I'll I'll add you in as as well. I think the there Adil, that was uh, there was a lot there. I'm just gonna turn it over to the panelists. I'm sure many of you have something you'd like to kind of respond to there. Or if not, I think there's. Or, 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 um, okay. or I could put, ask something a little bit more pointed. Sure, Adel. Yeah. So I, I. Oh, sorry, Marlene. Did did it look like you wanted to say something? Or. I mean, I was just thinking, um, you know, about your uh, about your reflections, um, and one of the the points that I think um, really um, struck me is what you said about this idea of corpor corporality um, and how um, you know afterlives um, in the digital, we tend to think of, you know, I mean, what, what Yakim was also talking about, sort of, you know, ways of seeing, um, but we don't often think about ways of feeling, right? Um, and sort of embodied ways of feeling. And so this is one of the things that I'm trying to get at a little bit in my work also, what is sort of the, the effective texture of these kind of afterlives and how, how does it find entry into people's lives? And sort of as somebody who's, um, you know, done a lot of ethnographic work, this is really what I'm trying to get at, but which is really, you know, quite, which you don't really get at with those those graphs and the, the scalar um, sort of representations, um, but I think that question of corporeality is really really important um, when thinking about after the afterlives of of social media and afterlives in social media. Um, so I think that's a point um, that we we tend to forget. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. I thought that was um, 
really helpful also for me to think through my material. I mean, I was, I think there's an interesting aspect. A lot of the, when we talk about what's corporeal, um, you know, the idea of being real and, and human online, I think a lot of the times when we're dealing with, when we look at accounts, Twitter accounts, social media accounts, you know, we, we, we conceive of these things in people and that's when these ethical questions are raised. And I, I find it's a lot, a lot of what I do. I mean, I look at a lot of accounts that are probably not real people, right? They're bots or they're auto automatons, right? And, and so when I'm dealing with them, I'm sort of thinking, well, what rights and ethics does a bot have if it's not a real person? But then I think, then I think back to many of these accounts used to be people. They, they were accounts that were either hacked or people let go and they were just hacked into and then sold off to a hacker. So they've been appropriated. So they've become like zombie accounts in a way, you know, so that the afterlife, people have got these accounts that they've used them for a bit, they've stopped using them, and then they've been repurposed for some other purpose, for some other reason, usually advertising and more often than not propaganda, right? So once the, these people have created accounts, they then, you might, they might find down the line that, you know, Tim Johnson from South of England finds that, you know, his a Twitter account that he opened six years ago and then left is now being, you know, used to, uh, pr praise Mohammed bin Salman or something. Uh, and, and this is not far-fetched reality. This is the reality of it. And so I think, you know, that was an account belonging to a corporate being, and now it's an account that's become this kind of automaton. And just to use a very, a very specific example, I mean, you know, I, I came across, like, two years ago, I came across um, an account that belonged to David Schwartz, who was a weatherman for the, the, the Weather Channel in the US. And he was very respected and well-loved. Uh, and he was tweeting about Saudi, like Saudi propaganda. The only thing is he had died two years ago or previous to this, right? He even had an op-ed in the New York, uh, sorry, an obituary in the in New York Times talking about it. And you had people who used to uh, watch David and be big fans of him interacting with his account, firstly saying, you know, um, you know, so sad that you died, except you were such an inspiration. And then people going, why are you tweeting in Arabic? You're dead. Uh, and, and then this kind of thing. And then you have these people then complaining to Twitter saying, look, his account's been hacked. Why can't we do anything about it? This is like a disgrace to his memory. Uh, and Twitter doing absolutely nothing until maybe a few months ago. You know, so, you know, they, they, often you lose again the control of your account, not just if you forget to use it, but if you, if you pass away, you know, what, what control do you have over these things and how are they repurposed and used in different ways? And, and there's often like a, a commodification there because if you have an old account, if I have an account from 2012 that that's, that's repurposed, that's probably a better account to have for propaganda because it's an older account, it's more authentic, it's less likely to be triggered as, by Twitter's AI as a, a new or a robotic account. So it has this pedigree. So, you know, this kind of, it, it, there's like a, a value to, to this old, you know, account that no longer exists. But yeah, so this idea of zombie, zombies political zombie accounts or whatever you want to call them is, is a very kind of real one. It makes me wonder about death, both real death and the death of someone's social media account. Maybe if you can just add to this, because um, this really, um, you know, going through um, my sort of, you know, this, the making of Kurdish digital afterlives, um, there's a lot of accounts that get hacked, Kurdish accounts that get hacked by Turkish, um, like nationalist hackers. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting, um, you know, when sort of talking about these zombie accounts and what that means for corporality. So often what happens is that Kurdish accounts that get hacked by Turkish nationalists, what they start tweeting is um, images of dead Kurdish bodies. Um, whereas Kurdish accounts, um, they would, um, they, they will tweet images only of people alive, right? Um, in order to commemorate them. So there's an interesting, you know, I, I, I just thought what you were saying about the zombie accounts really resonates with this idea of then, you know, mm. sort of, what kind of um, corporal images these accounts start posting. Um, and in that case, it's really sort of an attempt to, um, to cause offense, of course. Um, yeah. And there's also um, this interesting way in which these hacked accounts then use Kurdish language hashtags to insert um, this kind of um, content into the conversation um, that you know, sort of is, is, is meant to commemorate the martyrs um, mm. uh, that you know, in, the, in the eyes of these you know, hackers will probably be terrorists. Um, but so, it, yeah, there's an interesting sort of thing going on between these zombie accounts that then post images of, you know, um, mutilated bodies and these kind of things. So there's mm. an interesting thing going on between the violence that's done to real bodies and the way in which it sort of becomes incorporated into, into a zombie corporality mm. digital sphere. Yeah, I mean, it's 
the, 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 the term zombie actually seems very appropriate in that kind of, yeah. Yeah. with that image in a brutal way. I mean, maybe I'll just add to this. I mean, I, I wrote this down. This could be a whole other event. Um, hacks, bots, and zombies as it relates to some sort of a regional um, integration. But it, it's interesting here I, as a background, as a social anthropologist and having two people that are trained in anthropology. Um, I mean, I was really struck by this, uh, Yakin, what you said, the th thick data um, and big data, clearly a shout out to Gertz and thick description. And we have kind of these like juxtaposing core anthropological, you know, the collective and the individual, what does it mean for the individual, which I think um, you guys really had a, an attunement to versus this aggregation that gets to the scale that I found really interesting, Yakin, in, in what you were talking about. If I could, um, Yakin, you, you said that there were some other examples and I was just wondering if maybe you might have something else from the past 10 years from, from anything where you maybe could point to some of the scales that you're talking about or the frictions in those scales as we're trying to swallow or, or grapple with them. Yeah, so I think, uh, so before answering that, I just wanna, I was thinking about what Mark was saying about also the commodification of this process of like zombification and pots and so on. And I'm thinking along the NFTs and the technology of NFT, which is basically that Facebook profiles, for example, would be authenticated by blockchains or something like that. So it's kind of like a new mix of like bringing, privatizing the public if you want, but it's happening through like capitalism, right? So it's like the process of zombification was like a process of commodification and the opposite is also happening uh, right now. Uh, as for the question about the examples of the scale, to be honest, the starting point was uh, thinking about the, the question of remembering and forgetting. So, and, and this is thinking along, so as an anthropologist, I'm starting with my informants, along with my informants, and uh, to be honest, also with the Egyptian scholars who are thinking about the last 10 years and what happened in the last 10 years. And what was I thinking about is maybe the uprisings are not important. Maybe it's a distraction. Maybe maybe what is happening, because if you think about 2011, it is a reflection of 2008. And 2008 is a rehearsal of 2005. I'm talking about Egypt, the Egyptian context, where there's kind of like, I don't want to call it a movement, but something is happening in the social fabric, in, in the texture. I love the way you, uh, Malin, talked about like uh, the texture of like the hashtags, like it's, it's textile here, text, the textility is important, right? So, I mean, you keep going on back and back and you keep moving like to the front and so on. And so it was a way, my, my argument was a teaser. And to be honest, things are not clear for me. Um, I was thinking out loud with you, but how can we move beyond the event? Because I think we are stuck in events, right? And we are stuck in events in the sense that even at the very methodological level, I would say, uh, like we start with the event sometimes. How can we move beyond that? and move across the scale. So for example, the, at a very practical level, I will ask questions that I find my informants and my friends are asking. One question is how many times should one revolt? How many revolutions that should one participate in, right? How many photos, footage, material do you need in order to remember an act of witnessing? And forgetting, forgetting is a very important part of uh, uh, the experience, the lives of many of those around me. I'm talking about Gen Z in Egypt, like the uh, 18, 19, 20, who many of them witnessed the revolution and still remember it. And also talking about like many scholars in exile and artists in exile who are trying to forget, but the afterlife of the footage is also haunting them. Uh, and so what about that? How can one forget and how can one remember and what to forget and what to remember if you are surrounded all the time with footage that uh, have different meaning, different affective forces, I would say. This is my concern. And, and, and so the way to go to that was to think about the methodology of, of, of the scale. Uh, with, at what scale should we start?
So also just to add to that, I mean, we're, you're talking about uh, fabric and texture, but I also, when you were speaking, the scale also has a topographical, a landscape, a kind of like, you know, when you're talking about the, um, I, I just kept thinking of when you're on your mouse, you're on Google Maps, you're, you're zooming in and out and you're getting very different views yes. of something. Exactly. Um, But also the way, I mean, I really liked what Adil said about visualization as a performance. And to be honest, I never thought about it this way, but like, it's, it's like people do it this way. Like they curate, curate the, the visualization, but also in a way, it's a different way of looking at a scale, right? You don't zoom in and zoom out. You don't move right and move left or like it's new, new gap, like new dimensionality in a way. Uh, and I think all of this is in transition. Like it's not, it's not, it's emergent. It's not complete yet. Uh, and I think technology, and to be honest, the industry is faster than us. By far faster than us. We are much slower in trying to understand what's happening now. Um, yeah. I mean, we're very corporeal. <laughs> That's, a <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting you say that again, like just to say, I, I think that's one kind of uh, main thrust behind the digital 4A series is, you know, if, if we can't even keep up with all of that, we barely understand the technological advances in our lives. How do we kind of question what's happening on, around us? How do we do our research? Um, what does that look like? Um, and maybe with that, we can continue the, these questions, but I just wanted to kind of let everybody in the audience know it's open Q&A. Um, there's a couple of questions. We'll scroll back and try to integrate them. But if anybody else wants to kind of um, voice or chime in, now is your time. And while we wait for these to come in, I just want to sort of add that one of the things that that really compels me to consider a lot of these presentations, especially you know Mark and Marlene, uh, is is the, the 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 extent to which um, after the use of afterlives can become very sinister, um, and and that and who's who gets to determine how that works. And I'm thinking not just you know despotic governments and regimes of which we are absolutely familiar with, unfortunately, when we're dealing with the region uh, that we're interested in, but also corporations and how corporations are are playing that role. So I don't want to belabor that, but it's but it's definitely worth thinking about how those layers are being also kind of driven in interesting, compelling ways that we don't have as much autonomy as we think we do. I mean, I think there's an interest. I just want to raise it on the notion of. Uh, being ephemeral and corporality, I was thinking of the right to be forgotten, right? Yeah. So within the context of, you know, legislation now, certain populations have the right to be forgotten, right? Or at least in theory, they have the right to be quote unquote ephemeral mm -hmm. on the, in the online space. And I also think that's, it's interesting again, when we come to the Middle East, we're talking about so far, those, those kind of laws, as far as I know, don't exist, right? So you have this kind of disparity already between people in this region who have this lack of right to be forgotten. And I think of the right to be forgotten is actually, um, it's, it's, it's a way of, in a way, pushing back against corporations. I mean, if you look at Coldry's work on data colonialism, the whole aspect of data colonialism, data is an extractive process, right? Our data, whether it's Facebook, all our data points what we put on Twitter, our behaviors, our likes, are commodified, extracted, and sold to advertisers, mm -hmm. right? And so by by existing online, we're commodified. By not existing offline, it's harder for us to be commodified. But that commod online existence is now determined as well by the rights we have. So the fact is, if you li live in a legal, there's an inequality growing in, in terms of our ability to be, to, to, to be ephemeral. And, and again, that reflects these kind of historic kind of global north, or global south, or however you want to call it, you know, post-colonial kind of realities that I think is quite interesting. And then it, and there's many other reasons, but then it opens this, this other kind of region is how, how, how people in regions that don't have these protections are being exploited in different ways. Because if you don't have the right to be forgotten, you're more of a commodity, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I think that again, brings in this notion of like a digital orientalism that I think is interesting. And there's other aspects of that, that I think tie into how these regions are exploited anyway. But yeah. I think that notion, it can be tied into this notion of being ephemeral, and this transience online versus 
not being having that ability to yeah. extricate yourself from the web, which and again then, is a very yeah. good spider analogy. And then there's the right to <laughs> self commodify, which unfortunately yeah. is a thing. Like a lot of people only fans would like to be self <laughs> to commodify themselves <laughs> and, and actively participate in this. You know, that's um, that's true. Yes, I mean, exactly. a lot of a lot of our students nowadays, and and I don't mean to judge any. Uh, anyone's personal sort of inclinations are less, uh, perhaps not less cognizant, but more accepting of uh, the absence of scrutiny around invasion of privacy and the use of their personal data. And, and you know, I've yeah. been doing this experiment for the last 20 years, every class that I walk in on, irrespective of what I teach, I'll ask, are you comfortable with corporations accessing your private information on your, you know, on these applications or on, you know, wherever? And with you know it's I, I wouldn't be overstating to say that in those 20 years it's gone from being absolutely not don't invade my privacy to i'm sharing everything that, everything that is me and more online anyway so mm -hmm. no i'm it doesn't bother me in fact it helps them you know algorithmically curate what i need so you know people you know, people are more inclined to self-disclose and to see themselves as a commodity and their own sort of data and lives uh, are subject to that kind of exploitation, which, you know, I have my own judgment of, but nevertheless, it is it is happening. Right, people just want to be part of the singularity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. If if I may, I just um, there are two questions from the chat. I just want to throw on the table, and then there are two hands we'll um, get to. Leith has a question for you, Mark, specifically kind of about data, coll data collection, how you do this difficult task of getting things before they disappear. There's another question from Laura, um, specifically again for Mark about Clubhouse. Again, methodologically, how do you, um, how are you able to kind of navigate collecting these? Um, we do have two questions where we're going to unmute you. The first is from Skylar, and after Skylar, we'll get Nermeen and then turn it back over to you guys. Oh, I'm first. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Skylar. I'm an NYU alum uh, from anthropology, but I'm here in Arizona now. Very warm. Um, thanks. I'm sorry I, I was late, I, um, but I'm so excited to, that you guys are organizing this. Um, it's so relevant to a lot of things that I'm writing about um, and things that I've been thinking about alone. And so I'm so glad to have this conversation about method and but also and method is always related to the politics that we're doing right as writers and researchers and so i really like that question of like what scale do we enter at and i think that my perspective is that um this the scale or the multiple scales at which we enter at right have to depend upon our like our particular political like um what we want to do politically with our work and where what we want to do um and I'm also working on this question of commodification. I'm, I just wrote an, um, I made a short video and like I'm writing a paper for the um, another conference about um, visual practices of yoga and the commodification of like the female body um, and the ways in which um, <laughs> that's like, you know, amplified through uh, it, like infrastructures like Instagram. So anyway, um, I, I'm sorry, mine's not really a question, but more of a comment. Um, but I'll just say that I think that this is such an important, I think so many things that have been said already, like about digital orientalism and the ways in which these algorithmic infrastructures, that's sort of how I'm sort of thinking about it, is an, it's an infrastructure that allows like colonialism on an algorithmic le level. Um, are you know making particular kinds of conditions for different kinds of bodies, um, and in ways that are you know both new and old, right? And so we have to think about the ways in which, um, you know, the old forms of exploitation are you know being amplified on new scales, but but also in, also similar to the old ways. So thank you. Thank you, Skylar. We welcome comments as much as as questions. Um, next, Nermeen, and then we'll turn it back over to you guys. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. This is the first time that I find some of my favorite authors all together in one panel, so I'm so happy to hear and learn from everyone. I'll try to make this very short. I have a lot of questions, but for the time, my question is uh, for Mark. Um, 
there are actually two questions. So first about the ephemerality, and thank you for bringing up the point of there are to be forgotten. And it makes me think, for example, of the, the so-called Egyptian Me Too movement that started mainly over Insta Instagram, and it started primarily through stories, which is a very more ephemer ephemeral than other uh, forms of like tweets or Facebook um, posts, etc in a moment in which we see people are going to um, spending years in prison over a post, a Facebook post. So I think also that maybe ephemerality is a way to, you know, evade surveillance can be or being used in different and alternative ways. And uh, my second uh, question slash comment is about uh, the point you brought up on the private and the public and the ethics beyond and behind data gathering. I also work on Facebook in post-revolutionary Egypt and I also do like you, I scrape and grab a lot of data that are not mine and I put them on the cloud. But my line of like ethical reasoning, if that's possible, and I'm happy to share, to share this um, vulnerable side of research also, and I would love to know what you think of that, is that people have already signed up in the terms of reference with Facebook that their data is no longer theirs. Uh, for example, I'm in the University of Amsterdam and we used to have um, uh, um, a tool called Netverse, through which we scrape uh, and we analyze the data of Facebook, for example, and it used to work with a temporary license with Facebook itself. And after the hearing of Facebook and um, Cambridge Analytica scandal, Facebook stopped all of these tools and started to basically sell what we used to get as researchers for free to analyze and to work on and to understand. They used to sell it basically for advertisers. So at least my line of reasoning is that I'm trying to use these in a way that are kind of non-harmful and they are already breached by an act that is not mine and it's already happening for advertisement. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, I'm sorry for this long. So a handful of questions there, if anybody, um, including you, Adil, have, have comments about it. I mean, I can, uh, I can uh, start with answering some of Nermeen's questions, if that's okay. Because I, I think the, the notion of ethics and, and data is a really interesting one. And I, in many ways, I completely agree like, to the sense that people have signed these terms and conditions and consented to these various things, right? I think the only thing that I find problematic about that is that if you think of when one thinks of, say, data colonialism, Part of the whole notion of a colonial project is that colonialism often happened um, as a result of powerful parties imposing their will on some other, perhaps subordinate party, but usually with some entity collaborating, right? And for example, resources were extracted from a place, whether that was oil, with the limited or no consent of the population there. And I say limited consent because there's that, you know, the idea that if you were to read all the terms and conditions that we were confronted with, right, we, we, we'd spend days or hours doing it. So the, the kind of notion that reading terms and conditions is, is a sufficient kind of uh, agreement or between two parties is, is questionable, although I do have that same thing. And I think, for me, the justification lies more on the kind of, at least my perceived notion of ethics, you know, I approach it from the transformative paradigm in the sense that I believe in social justice. So I believe if people are bad actors, and I, and I agree there's a notion of subjectivity to this, if they are bad actors and they are instrumentalizing these, these tools in the pursuit of authoritarianism, in the pursuit of uh, repression, then shining a light on those behaviors is okay. And that's a good use of, and that's, a, that's an ethical use of data. That's how I certainly frame it. And I, I'm sure people can come at it different ways, but you know, if I was using this table like Cambridge Analytica and I was using it in order to try and theory control people or like influence their choices you know uh then then i would I, I think that is an unethical use of data so i think how we use that data is perhaps a better way of approaching it than than the terms and conditions things even though i i agree in perhaps in a legal context you know if people have signed that that's that's okay and to touch on the, the instagram i think ephemeral yeah i think there's an there's a there's a there's a good point to that i mean I, you know, I had a, I supervised a student who was doing a study on, on Qatari social media and they were looking at self-disclosure of Qatari women on Instagram. And although it wasn't about the Me Too movement, I encouraged them to look at the distinction between posting something, say, on your Instagram wall and posting something as a story. And 
most of the respondents said, yeah, the stories allowed them to engage in a little more self-disclosure than they ordinarily would because of the ephemerality, right? So that is an interesting relationship between functionalities of ephemerality and political expression. However, I think it depends on the case. Once the stakes get to a certain level, then the risks become high. And, and if you're, say, fighting against the regime, those benefits might be less because the regime might put more resource, resources in trying to document them, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I do, I do completely agree. Those functionalities do make a difference and they are important in, in diff modulating how we behave and how we perform our identity. Maybe um, I'd like I oh, sorry, Marlene, did you, did I just, you yeah, just a short point that I was thinking about in in question uh, in relation to the question of ethics. Um, and it made me think of that um, idea of ethnographic refusal um, and how as as researchers, um I mean, there's sort of you know how corporations um, and governments extract certain data um, directly from users, but also how you know we have to think of as researchers, maybe, I mean, I feel with the once you move into this digital realm where there's so much, where there's this um, seduction, sed seductive power of you know scraping data, gathering data, um, you know archiving data, st storing data, um, you know there might also be you know at certain moments. Or I've been thinking, you know, you know, doing this work, you know, how much do I expose things that maybe should not be exposed? Um, and so, at what point? Should there be a sort of a gesture of an ethnographic refusal to document, you know, certain things that are happening, where you know you just say like this, this might be off limits. Um, I, I don't think you know there's like a, a good answer to this, but I just think that this notion of you know sort of ethnographic refusal in you know might also work in a context of, uh, you know, sort of digital orientalism or or sort of this sort of digital extractivism, um, where you have to sort of you know sort of might think about what is what might we not want to extract um but yeah it sort of occurred to me that that might be a good way of of making a connection there can i jump in really quickly uh, and and i have to say i apologize the presence of anthropologists uh, with with us is is kind of driving me to be a little bit uh, kind of cliche about this but um what if, what if we begin to think about um the social media platforms themselves as the ethnographers, what happens if we begin to think about Facebook as a as a as a structure? I mean, this is a this is a you know the, you know Facebook is this kind of entity that came into our lives with the impression of, of that it's going to connect us with like-minded individuals, with family members. It it became extremely intimate, and then behind the veneer, behind that sort of smokescreen, are all these incredibly complicated kind of relationships. So it's almost like entry into the field. We are the field that's being exploited by these platforms, right? In such a way so that we can begin to disclose. So really, as ethnographers of uh, the sort of digital spaces and social media platforms, what we're doing is we're actually simply taking the data that has been uh, presented to us by the, the field researcher, which is essentially Facebook. And Facebook and, and social media platforms are in a position to arbitrate whether we deserve it or don't. It's almost like they're granting us uh, data or if we're going to pay for it. And at that point, it becomes commodified. The data itself becomes commodified. So I'm I'm a you know I'm a bit more sort of conscious of of the ethical problematics. I mean I agree with you, Mark, on this, but I'm I'm cognizant of the ethical problematics of um, uh, not because we are necessarily committing that wrongdoing, but because f these networks and these platforms and these structures, these algorithmic structures, are have created. Um, uh, relationship with participants, with inf what we are calling informants. When I use Facebook, I'm not an informant. I'm interacting with family members, with loved ones, with people that I care about under the impression that I can control these levels of relationship, right? Um, and even though I may be going public with a statement, I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily foregoing the, op the possibility uh, or I should say is I'm, I'm foregoing the possibility of having this data being mined by a researcher. Sorry, I mean, I don't mean you in particular, but someone in Amsterdam, you know, coming along and saying, oh, you know, it's Atlas Canada said such and such on this day, and this is what it's going to mean. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that relationship and then whether or not any 
as researchers, if we are by definition instrumental, right? We often think of ourselves, okay, well, this is a, I'm doing this for research purposes and, mm -hmm. and there's an ethical consideration and I'm going to do good with it. I'm either exposing, you know, despotism or pointing out the contradictions here or there, but there is an instrumentalization. And I wonder if we are more accepting of our own instrumentalization and less accepting of the instrumentalization of, let's say, corporations or, or advertisers. And, you know, we know where we stand on things, but at the same time, I think that self-criticism, which you invited, Mark, is so, I mean, there's, it's a, it spirals, you know? And I think that's kind of where Nermeen's concern come in. It's like, it's, it's real and we have to constantly grapple with it, recognizing full well that we may not be able to brush off that responsibility and, and, and we may not be able to feel good about it at the end of the day. It's okay for us to accept that we may not feel good about mining and excavating and scraping this data without full true consent in the way that we would if we were in the field and building those real relationships. I mean, I do wanna add, sorry, I, because I think it's a really important point. And I wanna add again, a thing on, on, on the notion of the consent we talked about, but also the, the notion that there's this relationship between us as a, as a subject, the data subject, and some external entity. But first on the consent thing, I think what's super interesting, I mean, if we talk now about the society in which we live and we look at digital capital, digital capital, and this ties into what you're saying Adel, about people, you know, um, some willing self-commodification in a way. In a way, we don't necessarily have a choice because if in order to engage with the economy now, we're in increasingly encouraged to be part of a digital economy, right? in many different ways. I mean, even on a level as an academic, I mean, a boss or a dean might be encouraging to use social media to do whatever, promote yourself and that kind of thing, right? So there's this notion that in order to be um, economically viable as a human unit, for want of a better phrase, uh, it, one has to engage, it has to have digital capital and digital culture. So there is this notion of there's pressure, even if there is this notion that we have some agency to consent to this thing, which which we do, but there's, pressure to be part of this digital ecosystem. And I think in terms of the the, the notion of data, the, our relationship with the corporations is a super interesting one, because obviously you could see this form of exploitation uh, in, in the kind of data colonialism so, so sense as Coldry talked about. But what about this kind of continuum of complicity? And this ties in again, this notion of, uh, is anything truly ephemeral? Because our behaviors, our actions, everything we do online is more or less it's used by machine learning tools to teach algorithms, to create data points on us that are then fed into these proprietary algorithms. So we become part of the proprietary algorithm. Our behavior informs these devices. And I joked about the singularity, but it is our behavior is in a kind of Kantian sense of this duality. Part of our behaviors have been recorded in the machine, become proprietary, and I'm then informing our own behavior. So there's this kind of complicity and continuity between us that, that kind of challenges the relationship of a strict data subject and you know uh, an external entity exploiting us, um, even though I am more inclined to sort of think as, as data subjects in that kind of sense. But I do, I completely agree, uh, but I, I almost see that there is this kind of complicity in that. But I mean, I wanna just suggest also that I think that the question of infrastructure is so adjacent to the question of ethics here. And I'm even thinking about like, if you are a researcher, you are working on the data. It's not just a question of getting the data, but also even computing. You have to do this computing on a different platform, on a cloud platform like Amazon or Google, whatever, right? And maybe the problem is not that you're giving away your data, but that you're not having a piece in these models, in these algorithms, right? So maybe the problem is that you, not that you don't own the data, maybe data is already everywhere. And the problem is that we don't have the rights to the models, the algorithms, the machines that we built by collective action, by collective data, dataization, if you if you want to say. So just yeah. That reminds me of a kind of the solidarity, like you know, the, the notion that we're workers, that we're workers, and you know, we don't own the means of production, uh, that we should fight to reclaim some of that, the things that we've created, right? They're intangible. 
I mean, the only control that we think we have is the ability to customize our selections when we're trying to purchase things. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, we can control your timeline, but you can't really control it in a sense. But, <laughs> but, we, but there is that sort of, again, the Baudrillard keeps coming up because there is that uh, both the simulation and the simulacra dimension of this performance of agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we have in those spaces. Um, but but Yakin's point is really... Yeah, I just wanted to, to add to that. I mean, what comes to mind, Yakin, I'm glad you brought up infrastructure. I'm just picturing, you know, games I used to play of shoots and ladders and Monopoly, right? And it's almost as if, you know, the game board are these different apps and platforms. There's certain constraints, there's certain rules. You operate within certain ways and um, you, you know, as as clear as the rules might be or not, you're kind of can can constrained in that way. If I can, because we're we're over time, and I'm loving this conversation, but I know we had another question from from Omar. If I can unmute you, and let me just encourage everybody else. I know there's some stuff happening in the chat. If anybody else wants to chime in, please raise your hand um, or or add it to the chat. Uh, hi, my question actually to, to, to Marlene, uh, like we do a lot with like uh, uh, of all of the, the question of, of, of martyrdom in the, in the digital like uh, sphere, where most of the focus on uh, as for us as scholars is focused on the repressive part. And the, but also the state uses those like the same politics into uh, in the, as a productive way to to like enhance statism, nationalism, like for example, like like from Turkey where it promotes like the the shahid when the uh, the dead soldiers, uh, where in in Syria also the use of shahid in Iran and all in this region is like the, the the use of those in the digital sphere like in uh, in in this productive way in creating like 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 nationalism. And the, the the other question for Mark is uh, <clears throat> is most of our tools of research like it's mostly focused on uh, Twitter uh, and uh, and it's it, I'm all the time in this question in my mind like I'm afraid if if we have this very limited uh, like tools or, that allows us to do our research what do we ex ex exclude from uh, like from from knowledge and, and uh, like um, it's not very well established question, but like it's the, the question of, of what do we exclude where we don't have like much of control of, of the data we, we can search. Like uh, most of our use uh, in the region, for example, is on Facebook and WhatsApp and all those like uh, uh, there's like encrypted like communications like and this is not. Uh, we don't have access to those. Uh, so like the question of uh, exclusion and uh, when we search in the, in the live archive like this. Do you want me to um, go ahead and, and respond? Um, yeah, so thanks. Thanks for that question. And definitely this is really, um, I mean, this notion of um, the productivity um, of afterlives is really something that's at the heart of, of the research that I'm doing. And so, um, you know, I look at the digital as one field, but then I look at other fields and I'm really interested in how afterlives are produced and how that production sustains forms of political community um, and, um, and aspirations to its sovereignty. And so definitely, um, I think that the fact that, you know, states like, um, you know, the big nation states, um, uh, in the region, Turkey, Iran, Syria, you mentioned, um, they, you know, each, of course, you know, draws, you know, I, I think what we can see very clearly is how these different um, sovereign communities draw on afterlives as a fundamental sort of uh, site and energy to sustain, um, to sustain sovereign power. And it's really this kind of, this political potency of the afterlife that I'm, and the productivity of it, as you called, as you mentioned, that I'm really interested in. Um, and trying to understand how that is produced concretely through, for instance, um, you know, tweets um, or um, other things I look at as ritual, um, you know, uh, film production, photography, these kind of things. Um, so I, I definitely think it's really important to think of this as a side of product, as something that's productive of political power. Um, 
and and so definitely I, I agree with you there but what's obviously interesting is how um so when you know when we're doing this um this digital research um one of the the difficulties is that um, the terminology is, you know, when you rely for these sort of more, you know, when you want to work with this big data and you, you try to scrape, for instance, Twitter is that, you know, um, because the terminology is often intersects on these different, you know, each, each, has, each political community has a mater cult, but the terminology is essentially the same. You end up sort of, you know, one of the difficulties is that you end up, you know, scraping, I scrape for, you know, I'm looking interested in the Kurdish martyrs and end up, you know, getting all, all this material on Turkish martyrs, you know, so it sort of highlights the difficulty of, you know, how, where do these things get entangled? How, how are these afterlives entangled? Um, so, you know, when looking at, on Instagram the other day, um, you know, I was looking for Kurdish material and I kept, you know, seeing like um, Azeri, um, martyrdom stuff um, and so it, it, it's sort of it's mind-boggling how you um, how these you know what sort of by nationalist um, uh, ideology is you know sort of there's this very clear boundary of these are our martyrs and the, the other the other side is a terrorist how you know when you start looking on digital media how you know these martyrdoms and these afterlives become sort of blend one into the other um, because there's a very similar terminology this use the aesthetics are very very similar um, so I've been quite fascinated and just like sort of ended up spending hours, you know, looking at, you know, how the aesthetics are so, so similar from, um, you know, movements that, you know, you know, would, would oppose each other as, you know, friend, enemy, macho, terrorist kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I'll stop here, maybe. I guess I can address the questions. But, um, I mean, I think there's, the, you know, the notion of missing data is always is always a good one you know it's uh and i think it ties in a bit with a question that uh, i think uh laura asked in the chat about clubhouse and and you know i think it's important to recognize when there's new platforms new digital platforms every digital platform has specific functionalities uh that mean it can be researched in specific ways twitter is obviously one of the most common things we talked about because of its api allows us to uh access that data relatively easily um, even if we're not, for example, you know, computer scientists, uh, whereas closed data things, we don't necessarily have access to it. the levels of access required to be able to investigate that on a large scale would presumably require police clearance or some sort of national security thing. So the nature of the, the, the platforms would always define the kind of uh, the, the kind of research or methodology that we can use. It's the same as club. I mean, clubhouse is interesting. I don't know what the, the company who makes clubhouse will make available to researchers, but at the moment, the the kind of methodological options I think open to research are, are kind of depend on discipline, but for certainly my perspective, it would it's a lot of ethnographic observation, and you know there's again ethical questions of recording what's going on, documenting what's going on. From my perspective, I'm someone who looks at state manipulation, so the questions I I I'm interested in also inform my method. You know, I'm interested in will it be used as a tool of surveillance? Yes. So how do I find that out? Well, I probably observe some of the rooms and sort of see if there's anyone engaged in intimidation of people for having specific opinions. I mean, I went in this other room the other day and it was just, I mean, I tweeted about it, but it was it was bizarre. I don't know if you use Clubhouse, but you have your profile picture. There was 40 pictures of 40 people with identical pictures of Mohammed bin Salman. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I could I mean, you're not technically allowed to screenshot or record, I think, the rooms in Clubhouse, but that doesn't stop people from recording on another device and then documenting that. And I've even seen people on social media record people who are, have been sharing opinions critical of say a specific country and then saying, hey, these people are traitors and then posting that video that they recorded online, right? Of course, that's violating the Clubhouse terms and conditions, but it's not like Clubhouse spoke to Twitter and say, hey, if anyone posts one of our things on your platform, can we ban them? You know, there's no sort of, uh, coordination committee between these two things and i think that's interesting but i think crucially you know we have to work with the methods that we allow that we are able to within a specific platform or on a specific platform and yes that that negates often the ability to do for example massive scale research on say whatsapp conversations or that it can be done but we just have to adapt i think you know and and, and ask research questions that we can actually effectively answer um and uh, you know that's and that's the, the blessing of Twitter as much as I rail against Twitter. It's definitely allowed us to do interesting research in, in, on scales that we probably didn't imagine before, I think, and express our ways in ways that we, we couldn't before. And I think that's key. And to just to add to the question of tools I use, I use lots of different ones like Node Excel, Gephi, 
Tableau. I'm not going to go into too much details about them, but if you email me, I, we can talk about it. So maybe just um, for the sake of time, I just indicating we're going to stop the recording, speaking of um, surveillance and ephemerality, and we'll come out of the spotlight view. We'll all be here. If anybody then wants to kind of voice or chime in, um, now the, the panel is ending and we're going to go to the kind of um, mingling and informal, but I um, hope everybody can stay and kind of continue the conversation. <laughs>